word and also love for it. So let's read um, verses 10, 11, 12 together um, from 53. Let's read. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to the accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen. This is the word of God. And praise the Lord, Mike is back. Uh, I believe that one of the most important documents um, that um, America cherishes and has is the Declaration of Independence uh, that was proclaimed back in 1776. How many years is that? Like 240 years, is it? Something like that. Ago, uh, on July the 4th, I believe. And uh, as you know, it was drafted by Thomas Jefferson, the founding father of this country. And uh, if you went to school here, you probably studied and understand the principles of philosophies behind this important document. Because this document ensures the freedom or liberty and uh, equality that uh, we all have, and also opportunity for happiness, pursuit of happiness, is guaranteed by this written document. And this document also becomes a foundation for the Constitution of the United States. And uh, it also it becomes a, a basis for many other declarations of independence, independence in the 19th century in other countries, I hear. Uh, and uh, even to today, this uh, document is the basis for everything we do uh, in life here in the United States. Socially, economically, um, culturally, education-wise, it becomes the basis for all things. Uh, even if you have, haven't read the entire thing, uh, which is in Washington, D.C., you probably know the second sentence of this important document. And it goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you remember that from your school days? Actually, there's a slide on that, Faisal. <laughs> Actually, the next slide. But I want to ask you this morning, uh, you know, like the air we breathe, you know, we are living in a free country, and uh, probably America is the, you know, country, the, you know, in the world, the number one country that truly lifts up these values and um, guarantees that we all have liberty and life and pursuit of happiness. But do you feel happy this morning? Are you happy? Because it's in the Declaration of Independence and it's in the Constitution of the United States. Are you happy because of this statement? You don't look so happy this morning. <laughs> well, and it actually, we're not always happy. We're not always content with the things that we have. Of course, uh, from the government level, from the uh, legal standpoint, you know, this is an important document, and this guarantees um, a, a freedom and equality uh, in this country. But in reality, in real life, we struggle uh, with uh, equality. There's a lot of racial discrimination and uh, conflict between the races and people group in this country. There are people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, to violence, and they're not, obviously not happy. And there are people who are always stressed out because of the business of life, busyness of life, because of the weight of the things that they have to do, accomplish in order to succeed. So as we, again, ask the question, are you happy, truly happy? Um, not many of us would actually say, I am happy. Because not only do we need an independence, a declaration of independence 
from a tyrannical rule like you know the British uh, a long time ago, and uh, it has to be upheld by a document like this. Not only do we need independence from foreign countries or the government even, but we truly need the independence from sin, from the uh, the chains of sin. And the only person that can give us, that can declare this kind of uh, freedom for us, is God Himself. As we struggle in our personal, interpersonal relationship, the conflicts, the misunderstandings, we want to be free of those stresses in our lives. And we want to be free, free of uh, fear, uncertainty in each, every, and every day life. And most of all, we want to be free from the fear of death itself. We truly need a declaration of independence from sin in our lives. And thus the title of my sermon is Declaration of Independence from Sin. The only person that can declare, that has the power, that has the authority to declare such independence is God himself. We're in the, uh, the sermon series of Prophet and Kings, the Gospel Project, and we've been looking at different kings and different prophets. And we've been looking at Prophet Isaiah from last week. And uh, that's where we are also discussing this week as well. We'll be discussing from the life of uh, Isaiah, an important message that he has given to us. And uh, I believe Isaiah 53, chapter 53, is a an in, uh, declaration of independence, spiritual declaration of independence from our sins. As we understand what God's blueprint was to eradicate sin from our lives, as we understand how God unshackled the chains of sin and even death, we get to live out that freedom that God has given you and I as people of God. First, let us go back to the well-known document, this document, this declaration of God to understand what is God saying about our sins. What is God's declaration against our sin, the uh, ultimate problem of all humanity? And I find two important declarations that God makes concerning our sins, your sins and my sins. The first is this, that God will have his Messiah sacrificed for our sins. He declared this. God will have his Messiah sacrificed for our sins. As we look at back at this background of this book uh, of Isaiah, we remember Isaiah when he was called. It was a time when King Uzziah, the great king, the greatest king after Solomon, he had passed away. And so the nation was in turmoil, it was in dismay, dismay and there was little hope. They were hopeless. They didn't know what to do after that. And so there was a lot of despair and um, people's heart was downcast. And actually God saw this situation and God was, seemed like downcast as well. He was distressed. In fact, he was in deep sorrow because the first chapter of the book of Isaiah starts with a, a very, in a very gloomy note. Um, let's read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. I want us to read this together. It's on the screen for us. And uh, you can kind of get the tone of God's, God's uh, heart as he's uh, proclaiming this to his people. This is the background to this book. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. I'm sorry, chapter 1. It's on there, Faisal. There you go. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's read these verses together, shall we? The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But I, Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, uh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. As you read this, I don't know if you can pick up God's heart here, his, his sense. He's saying, uh, even the ox knows its owner. The donkey knows who it, belongs, who, it, who it belongs to. But my daughter Israel has forgotten me. And as a result, they are deep in the ocean of sin, of iniquity. They are in trouble, and they are deeply corrupted. They are rotten to the core. There is no remedy for them except to eliminate them, to cut them off 
That's what God is saying. And if you read in verse 2 of this chapter, the previous verse, God is making an appeal to heaven and earth. Oh, heaven and earth heal like a, uh, like a court, in a court setting. He is, he is uh, talking to his, his jury, as the creation as his jury, saying, Oh, hear heaven and on earth, hear my voice. How my people have forgotten me. The donkey and the animal cow ox knows its owner, but my people have forgotten me. And as a result, they are deep in sin. Remember how, what a contrast it was when we remember how Isaiah saw God's glory. In the vision of Isaiah, when the vision of uh, Isaiah's calling, he observed the holy, holy, holiness of God. What is the holiness of God? It was the impeccable ethnic nature of God. It was the perfect truth of God. He always speaks the truth. It was the perfect righteousness of God, the justice of God. Contrast to that, his people, God's people, were laden with iniquity, it says, offsprings of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. And we can hear God's sigh, his sorrow, his tears, as he sees his daughters, daughter Israel, deep in trouble, deep in sin, like a cancer, like a tumor, ready to be cut off. Imagine you planted a, a vineyard, you know, a vine, Great, you want to have grapes in the, in, the, in the summer. So you plant it in the winter and it grew and, and it's, uh, the, 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 the branches came out and it started to bear fruit. And you um, watered it and you gave it fertilizer and you put a lot of love and effort into this plant. Only to realize in the summer, like in June or July, all kinds of birds came and picked on your plant, your grape. All sorts of insects uh, ate, ate your your delicious grape. And when it was time for harvest, there was barely any grapes left. It was devastating. As God sees his Israel, his daughter Israel, he is saddened because he loved it so much. He even sacrificed so many prophets, so many kings to raise this amazing people of God. But after many years, he sees the, the city is desolate. It has been attacked by foreign enemies and taken advantage by all nations. It's worshiping idols. And people are corrupt. There's conflict among people. They don't obey what God's law said, but they take advantage of each other, each man for himself. I'm, I'm gonna, I want to ask this morning, are we in some respect like that to God right now? He saved us from our sins through Jesus Christ. He, he paid with his beloved son, and we have this life, amazing life, from God the Father to the Son. But would God be sad this morning, frustrated even, as he sees us always stumbling over sin in our lives, temptation? And are we so busy in the world that we are so lazy with God? We are supposed to be more than conquerors, royal priesthood, kings and, and, and princesses and queens of God. But are we living in this world being reigned over, reigned over by the business, the, all of the tasks that we have to do? And so we have forgotten the authority of the sons and daughters of God. This is the result of sin. This is the result of the shackle of sin that pervades all humanity. And it was especially here in the, in the southern kingdom that God was watching over. What is God's plan? What is God's answer to this problem of sin? Well, God's answer was, is found in today's passage, Isaiah 53. We know this passage very well. But I want us to look at it in a fresh perspective, as if for the first time, as if you were reading the first draft of this Declaration of Independence. What was God's blueprint to save humanity? No, just save you and I from the shackles of sin. And again, going back to our scripture, it says God will have his Messiah sacrificed for our sins. That was the first declaration that God pronounced as he saw his people Israel and as God saw us. God says the, the main theme of chapter 53 of Isaiah is that God will redeem his people through his chosen suffering servant. 
What does it mean that God will redeem? It's saying God will pay back. He will buy us back so that we could be His once again. God will pay the price for our sins on behalf of us. And that payment sum would be His suffering servant that He is mentioning in chapter 53. And the reason that this servant will be suffering, his suffering has a reason. We find this reason in verse 10, and it's not something that you might have expected. Let's go back to verse 10 of 53 that we read this morning. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. It says that God wanted to crush. It was his plan to destroy his chosen Messiah. In fact, the New Living Translation says, it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. It was not by accident. God was actively, it was actually planned out. It was his blueprint in his master plan of salvation to sacrifice, suffer his Messiah. God was the one initiating. He was the driver in sacrificing this Messiah. And as a result, as this Messiah became the offering, guilt offering, so to speak, in verse 10 it says that, right? He put into grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. What is the guilt offering? In the Old Testament, Leviticus, we know that it was an a, a, a object that was offered to God to forgive someone's sins. And this Messiah, this, this suffering servant became that servant, became that guilt offering on our behalf. And God was the one who initiated this. He's the one who planned this and he declared it. And uh, we also see the part of the suffering servant. It was not out of reluctance that this servant just had to submit and had to obey. No, he willingly submitted to this will of God and he obeyed, right? It says, he shall see the... Um, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. It's an active verb. He, his soul makes, he is making the offering of guilt for the people of God. There's an uh, Old Testament scholar by the name of Alan Maltier, and he makes this point. In the Old Testament, when a guilt offering is offered to God, you know, usually an animal, right? The animal has no consciousness of what it's dying for, Right? It's being killed. It's being offered as a sacrifice. And it's just, I guess it's sad because it's dying. It's dead. <laughs> uh, taken by surprise. So there's no consciousness. It's not aware. It's not conscious that the, the animal is dying for somebody's sin. But the ultimate sacrifice, this guilt offering of this suffering servant was a very conscious, very obedient, uh, willing submission to God's work. Because this Jesus Christ, who is the suffering servant, we find out later in the Old Test New Testament, he was conscious, he was aware. Even on the cross, he refuses to uh, have that, that, uh, the wine, right? So he, he was very aware, he knew what he was doing, and he willingly went to the cross and sacrificed his life, like this very verse says, like the blueprint of God indicated. To the last moment of his last breath, he knew. He intentionally died for you and I at that moment. What was the result of this sacrifice of God? What was the result of this sacrifice of this Messiah, the suffering servant? In verses 11 and 12, we read that in verse 11, um, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Many make many to, the account, uh, to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. In a nutshell, because of his sacrifice, because of his suffering, it says, he has made us righteous. He has cleansed us of our sin. What is righteousness? What is righteousness? The word righteousness goes back to a base, regular meaning of making something straight. Making in a straight line. Right distance means to make something in a straight, draw something in a straight line. Used with reference to morality, righteousness means living or acting in the right way. But the question is, what is the right way? What is our standard of right? What is righteousness? 
scripture offers the standard. The righteousness that's offered in the Bible is the ultimate standard of the righteousness of God. He is the standard that we always look up to. And when Jesus sacrificed himself, he made us righteous. Not only is he righteous, he made us righteous through his sacrificial offering. And when we did that, did that it means that he made us aligned with God, aligned to God's will, God's righteousness, his standard, his absolute righteousness. He is the measure of moral right and wrong, and he has made us not as sinners. He declared us righteous people. We call this sanctification, right? Justification and sanctification. That we are not righteous people. We are sin, sinful and corrupt. But because of what the sacrifice of Jesus has done for us, he has indeed, God has indeed declared an independence from sin. You are no longer a sinner, but you are righteous. You are no longer bound by the, the suffering of sin, but you are unshackled from the torment of sin, the effects, the pangs of sin. And all this was possible by God having his Messiah sacrificed for our sins. That was the one-sided declaration of independence from our sins of God. Secondly, what was the second uh, part of this declaration of independence from sin? It is this, that God will have his Messiah, not only sacrificed for our sins, but God will have his Messiah see his offspring. That is the second part of this declaration, that God will have his Messiah see offspring. In verse uh, 10, let's go back to verse 10, the latter part of verse 10 says this, he shall see his offspring. This Messiah will see the offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It says that this Messiah will see seeds. It means that there will be descendants. There will be followers as a result of this sacrifice of the suffering servant. In the Old Testament, in the Bible, we hear many things about the seed, right? The seed of Adam you know, that someday a seed of Adam will come, Adam and Eve, you know, they will have descendants, but there will be a particular seed of Adam. Also, Abraham's seed. Those who are of Abraham's seed are the promised people who are the chosen ones. And we hear in our passage as well that this Messiah, this suffering servant, will have seed. They will have followers uh, in the later generation. And uh, we know from our New Testament that uh, the seed are disciples of Jesus Christ who are following the slain Lamb of God. In Revelation chapter 7, we see these seeds, so many of them, worshiping our Lord ultimately in heaven someday. Let's read these verses together. Re uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 together on the screen. Ready, go. After this, I looked, and I behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribe, and all people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hand, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation brings belongs to our Lord God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Amen. Just like when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, people had palm branches. A couple of people, a few people welcomed Jesus. Hosanna, the king, welcome in the name of our Lord God. At the last of days, when there's a new heaven and new earth, there will be a great multitude from all nations, from all language groups, all people groups, shouting that, Jesus, salvation belongs to you. And these are the seeds of this Messiah who has suffered for them. These are the people who have become righteous as a result of the sacrifice of the Son of God. We must remember that there are seeds, many seeds, as a result of the work of Jesus Christ, of the suffering servants uh, in history. There will be people who have been saved, who are forgiven, wearing these white robes someday and worshiping our Lord together. And this is our vision for missions. The reason we do missions is to see all the nations and people groups come together and worship together the Lamb of God. As people of God, especially if you are a leader uh, serving the Lord, sometimes you get uh, lonely. 
as you are worshiping your Lord quietly each morning, maybe at your work, as you're praying to God each day, as you're serving the Lord, you might wonder, are there people around me that are also worshipers of God? Especially when you talk about God in the workplace or in the street, you feel like you're the only person that worships our Lord Jesus Christ. But the scripture reminds us that there will be a multitude, seeds of Jesus Christ, who trust in this Lamb and praise that you are worthy, Jesus. You've accomplished the salvation. Salvation belongs to you. And the scripture, this declaration also says, not only will, have seed, will he have seeds, but uh, his life will be long. Right? Uh, verse um, 10, going back to verse 10. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. It's an understatement, right? His days shall be long. It means that he will resurrect and he will reign as king forever. And verse 12, it continues on this concept of this resurrected king. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. It, picture yourself seeing this victorious war general coming with all the spoils of war. This general is Jesus Christ, and he has defeated and conquered sin and death itself. And as, as a good you know, general, as a good leader, he brings all the spoils of war, which is life. He's defeated death, and he's giving it out to all his people. This is the declaration of independence from death, in fact. And God shows us this vision, this passage from days of Isaiah, that we do have the power to conquer death itself. First Coloss uh, Corinthians chapter 15 uh, says that Jesus has become the first fruit of those who are asleep, which means someday when we get to meet our Lord, we will also have resurrected bodies like Jesus Christ. And just like everybody died as a seed of Adam, all who are in Christ will have life through his resurrected power, it says. Yes, Jesus gives us the life. This is the declaration of independence from sins. He will give us a resurrected body. We, know, we probably know this uh, declaration very well from you know, the depths of our heart that Jesus, he sacrificed for us and he resurrected to reign as king in our lives and he also gives us the, the power of resurrection in the future. But let's look at what Jesus is doing right now in verse 12 of the very last part of verse 12. It says, He bore the sins of many and makes intercessor for the transgressors. What's Jesus doing now? He is at the right hand of Father God and he is intercessor and he's praying for you and I, for you and me to continue to enjoy, to really live out this life that we have of independence from sin. How shall we live as people who know what God has declared already in our lives? I believe we've, we know all this very well, 53, and what God has done for us, the independence from sin and all that. But what does that mean for you and me today? How shall we live? Before I get to that uh, application, I want to share a story of uh, my first well, not my first, but one of our early mission trips. Uh, I had led the team to Nicaragua uh, you know, many years ago, not from, with our church, but it was probably the first mission trip that I led, 15 people. And uh, we had prepared a lot. I was stressed out, right? Think about all the logistics that goes in. You have to practice the language, and you have to prepare the people that, so they will have something to share with the locals. You also prepare, you know, medicine uh, that you could take in, and also VVS toys and kid stuff and vitamins, all these stuff. It's just a lot of work to go to a mission trip. And I was just stressed out. And imagine you being the leader. You are the one having, you're responsible for everybody's well-being in this foreign country, the poorest country in Central America. And they just had a civil war, right? It was difficult. So I was scared, and uh, we had this first orientation with the missionary on the first day. 
And uh, what he said was really, it really uh, reassured my heart. He says, uh, brothers and sisters, there's nothing for you to do here. Jesus has done everything for us. Just enjoy and relax. You know, I don't, I don't know about you. It gave me such, such comfort to hear that, you know, that you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you know, obviously, we've got a lot of stuff, and we have a whole week of ministry, but just the statement that Jesus has already done the work. You don't have to do anything. Just enjoy God this week. That gave me so much peace and comfort. And I think back at that moment and think about today in our lives. Isn't our life a mission trip? Every day is a mission trip by God. God has sent you on a mission on this earth. And uh, if you have to take charge of your life, all the things that you have to do, it's in your hands, and you feel like you're responsible, you have the burden of the world on your shoulders. But if you realize that Jesus has conquered death, and he cares for you, and he has redeemed you, if that becomes a reality, not just a Bible knowledge, not something that you know by in your head, but if it becomes a reality that, yes, Jesus has redeemed me, and the death and the power of sin is no longer upon me, we, have, we can have this tremendous relief, tremendous joy that comes from him. As I'm preparing, as you know, the small group seminar this week, I'm kind of stressed out, emailing people all over the, uh, the Bay Area, like 70 pastors, and waiting for the RSVPs, and registering them, and, you know, funds going in there, and, and it's been in the newspaper, and, you know, people hear about it, and I'm just anxious, you know, are we able to be able to pull this off correctly? But suddenly, as I pray, I realize that, why am I so anxious? This is not my event, is it? We're doing it for the Lord. Jesus told us to do it, told me to do it. Why am I acting like I'm the owner of this event? Jesus has already done his work. And Jesus wants to simply use us. Why am I acting like I am the master and I am the owner of this event? And I was reminded of this particular verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which I want us to read together. Verses 6 and 7, uh, these two verses that's on the screen. Let's read it together, these two verses, as a reminder of what uh, God wants, how he wants us to live. Ready, go. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, yes. casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Verse 7 is, uh, is a gospel to us, isn't it? Casting. Just throw all your anxieties on him. Not just blind faith, but there's a reason, a basis for that. It says, it says, because he cares for you. Oh, what an understatement. He loves you and he died for you and he redeemed you from death itself. If you don't fear death, what is there to fear in life? Because of this declaration of independence from sin, Peter is uh, exhorting, he is encouraging us to cast, just throw all your anxiety on him. Um, I did this scientific research for 40 years. You know, you're about to see amazing results that uh, has never been revealed. You know, 40 years, you know, by a pastor, scholar, you know, teacher. And I, I found this, this correlation the more you pray, the less you worry. Can you show us that result? This amazing graph, right? 40 years of research, I found this correlation. You pray zero, and your worries are like way up, high, ceiling high. But as you pray, as you cast your worries every day on Him who loves you, the worries goes down. There's no worries. There's no fear. Because He loves you you. Brothers and sisters, let's not just know what the independence of the declaration of independence of sin is by God, but let's live it out. That's why this scripture is here for us this morning from the Old Testament. God is showing us his blueprint from the beginning, before even he sent Jesus Christ, that he wants us to, he wants to unshackle us from the effect, the fear, the death of sin, and to live as redeemed sons and daughters of God. 
if we are still shackled by sin, if we are brought down by the worries of the world, maybe like chapter 1 of Isaiah, God is still crying out to the heavens and earth, why is my son, why is my daughter shackled to sin and in despair and uh, in judgment? Let us let go of these worries and once again, cast all our fears and anxieties on Jesus Christ who has loved us and is even loving us at this point and praying for us, intercessing before Father God. Let's uh, rely upon him and cast away our fears and anxieties this week. Amen. Let's pray to our